This message is brought to you by North Ringwood Uniting Church, a God-focused, grace-filled community helping you grow. We hope you enjoy. All right, thanks everyone for coming out tonight, for neglecting your mothers and being here instead. Woo! Thank you for <laughs> so, so my name is Matt, and like Chris mentioned, we're starting a new series tonight called Imago Dei, which is Latin for the term image of God. Now, who's heard that term before, the image of God? Yep. So we're going to be spending four weeks leading up to SYG looking at what it means that you and me and everyone else is created in the image of God. And we're using this week's message as sort of like a foundational message that's going to lead us into deeper discussions around the image of God and human rights and people with disabilities and work and our day-to-day lives. But to start this week's message off, what I want you to do is turn to the people around you and just say hello, ask how they are and things like that. Pretty straightforward. Just have a quick conversation with the people around you. All righty. Quiet time now. (laughs) <laughs> oh. So the reason why we've done that to start with will be clear by the end, but one of the goals from this message is that you'll have a greater appreciation about how deeply defound, profound even just a conversation like that is. And so to start with, we need to work out what the image of God actually is, and you'll find this term on the first page of your Bibles in Genesis 1, so if you have a Bible on your phone or paper copy, then feel free to open it up. It's On the first page, you should be able to find it pretty easily. (laughs) Now, Genesis 1 is a challenging text, and it's particularly tough because it wasn't written for our culture, and so our 21st century brains can struggle to wrap our minds around it. And what we're going to do is we're going to read a bit of it, and I'll try to provide some context for you so we can understand what God means when he's saying that we're made in his image. But as another goal from this message, what I want each of you to leave here tonight with is a greater appreciation of who you are and about how special and important each one of us is in God's eyes. Now, I heard someone who doesn't believe in God say that you and me and all of humanity, we're just the product of nothing plus time plus chance. That we're all here because of a lucky set of accidents occurring over billions of years, and that's it. And I'm hoping to show you tonight that through God that we are all much more than that. And I also want to remove the popular idea that seems to float around some churches that God just puts up with you. That the idea of Christianity is that you get saved and then you behave. That, yeah, God loves you, but it's sort of a begrudging sort of love. And I'm hoping to show you tonight that through God your life is so much more than that. And we can see it in Genesis 1. So... As we know, Genesis 1, God has just been creating everything. He's speaking things and things are happening. Things come into existence because God commands them to come into existence. And then after he's finished creating everything, he creates the pinnacle of his creation. So I'm going to read Genesis 1, 26 to 31. So it's up on the screen as well. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give, give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So let's break it down for a little bit. So the first thing that we need to understand if we want to truly grasp just how revolutionary this text of writing is, is that in other cultures around at the time this was written, the image of God was used to describe kings. Like a king would be called the image of God. You'd find it on their statues or inscribed for them because they ruled on God's behalf over everyone else. 
And some places like Egypt and Babylon, they went even further. The kings were seen as the embodiment of God, meaning that everyone thought that they were a god. And so the image of God was something that was reserved for kings and these really high rulers, and it meant being a physical representation of God on earth. And that's why the Sphinx is protecting the pyramid. The Sphinx is sort of like the cherubim in the Bible. They're these animal-like, semi-human creatures that protect the divine presence. The divine presence being the pharaohs in Egypt. You have three pharaohs who are buried behind the Sphinx. And so Israel is part of a cultural environment where these powerful men are calling themselves the image of God, saying that they are God, or at least they are the representatives of God, and they're using this claim to rule over others. And throughout the Bible, we have the biblical authors teaching the world and teaching the culture that exists at the time something completely new. Namely, it's not just that these rich, powerful rulers are made in the image of God, but that everyone is. And so let's keep going a bit deeper into this. I want you to imagine that you're an ancient Israelite hearing Genesis 1 for the first time. See, in Genesis 1, God is depicted as this royal figure who is creating things. He has this power and authority to speak and things happen, which is quite similar to how a human king works. Think about it. A king would say something and it would happen, like, go get me a goat or go build me a pyramid. The king had the power and the authority to speak and for that then to happen. And so ancient readers would have read Genesis 1 and said that this God is acting like a king. He speaks and things happen. God says that he wants a sun and an earth and plants and animals and these things happen. Creation obeys the command of the king. And other biblical writers pick up on this idea of God acting like a king or a royal figure. Psalm 33 says that for God spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. And it's describing God creating things using language of commanders and kings. And so that's the depiction of God in Genesis 1. He's bringing order and beauty into chaos and darkness in the universe. And then the pinnacle of Genesis 1, verse 26, God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, with the poetic summary in verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image, meaning God's own image. In the image of God, he created them, so God created mankind. Male and female, he created them. So an ancient reader of this text would read Genesis 1 and they wouldn't be blown away that God is acting like a king who commands things and these things occur because they see that happening already every day by their own kings. But they'd be absolutely astounded by this God who creates humanity and says that all human beings are made in my image, male and female. See, they'd be astounded by this God who says that everyone is made in my image and likeness. And not only that, in verse 26, that they rule and they represent me. Not just kings and pharaohs, but everybody represents me, saying that you and I represent God. And so to fully appreciate how mind-blowing this would have been for an ancient Israelite, we need to continue to dig deeper into the worldview of the cultures around at the time and how they depicted God ruling and reigning and how these cultures saw the purpose of human beings. We need to look at other creation accounts that existed at the time because it's from creation accounts that we get really big meaning of life sort of answers to questions. Why you were created determines your purpose. Think of even if you're creating something, when you create something, how you fashion it determines what it can and can't do. Like, for example, you can't make a footstool with the intent of cooking a pizza on it. You create the footstool with the intent of resting your feet on it. Why something is formed determined, determines its purpose. And so why God made you has a huge implication on what the meaning of your life is. So let's look at some other creation accounts from around this ancient time and we'll see what other cultures saw the purpose of God and the purpose of humans are. And the most famous other creation account that existed around the time is probably the Babylonian one called the Enuma Elish. And it's this tale about the Babylonian gods and about how one of their gods, Marduk, defeats the forces of chaos and that's in the form of this goddess called Tiamat, or known as the Big Dragon. And this is a very quick note summary, but what happens is there's this big war between the two and Marduk blows this giant wind that inflates Tiamat's throat, sort of like when you open your mouth in front of a fan and it blows your mouth open. And he shoots an arrow down her throat and then he rips her in half. 
And then he takes one half of her body, and with that half he makes the sky, and with the other half he makes the land. And that's how they say the world was created, which is a pretty cool story. But what the Babylonian creation says, better than our one. So, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, so what the Babylonian creation story is trying to say so far is that the earth and everything in it is born out of a violent conflict between the gods. So compare that to Genesis 1 and how it says that God created the heavens and earth. And then later in that story, the gods get tired of making food for themselves. So what they do is they kill one of their gods, like in their group of gods, a god called Tingu. What they do is they slit his throat and they pour his blood on the land and then they mix his blood and the dirt to make humans with the purpose that these humans would be slaves to the gods, that these humans would bring them food. So again, in the Enuma Elish, we have... The life is born out of a violent conflict between the gods. And what do we see as the point of humanity? What is our meaning of life? It's that you and I were born to be slaves to the gods. And these stories are told and passed on throughout the generations to make it clear to, say, a Babylonian farmer that your purpose in life is to be a slave to the gods. And not only that, remember that as a Babylonian farmer, you believe that the king that you see, say, once a month or so at the monthly sacrifice, you believe that this king is the embodiment of Marduk, that Marduk has legitimated this king as the only image of God and as ruler every, over everyone. So what would that mean for you? Well, it means that you'd better pay your taxes. You'd better submit to this king. Remember, you exist to feed the gods, and if the king is the image of God, then you exist to feed him. You exist to serve him. And so you can see how these stories, like the Enumeral Leash, legitimize the power structures of the, day, of the day. And you can see just how revolutionary and how contrary to that Genesis 1 is. In Genesis 1, we have a God who doesn't have any rivals. There's no conflict between darkness and chaos. There's no violence to create things. In Genesis 1, we have a God who just speaks and things are. There's no pantheon of gods fighting for control. There's just the Trinity working together in perfect harmony. And then God makes all humanity, male and female, is his image. Not just a king or pharaoh, but all of humanity is made in the image of God. All of humanity has this royal dignified task to rule the world on God's behalf. And so you have to think as a Babylonian farmer, what kind of world does that create compared to the one that they were living in? For one, I think it's a society that's a lot more equal. And even think back to ancient Israel. Remember the laws that God gave to Moses. Israel was to have no kings. It was only when the Israelites begged and pleaded for God to, for them to have kings that kings existed in Israel. And so hopefully you can see how Genesis 1 is giving a view of the world and who God is and what humans are that is vastly different to the culture that they came from in Egypt or Babylon. And so instead of humans being created to be slaves to the God, in the Bible, we have humans being created to be representatives of God and to work alongside him. And it's really interesting. The word for image in the Bible is the same word that's used quite a bit elsewhere in the Bible, and it's the word idol. The word image and the word idol are the same Hebrew word. To be made in the image of God is to be made as an idol of God. And you smart Bible students out there would probably say, but hey, doesn't the second commandment say, don't create any idols or any images of God? So what's going on? Selfie <laughs> yeah, selfie bad. That is the message version. So let's think. What does an idol actually do? Well, an idol points to a greater truth. So think of a photo of your family hanging on the wall. That photo is not actually your family, like flesh and blood. It's a picture of your family how it's set up and how it's structured to show to others. It po it's there to point to a greater truth. Or think of a statue in the middle of a city. It exists to remind people of the person represented. People don't honour and respect the statue, they honour and respect the person the statue is of. In the same way, we are made in the image of God. We are a picture of God to show to each other, to point to a greater truth. So when God is telling us that we shouldn't be creating any idols or any images of God, any golden calves or things like that, he's telling us that because he has already created an idol or, or an image of himself, and it's us. We are unique. We are special in all of creation. Only God can bestow his image on something. So creating and worshipping a golden calf is a grave and sin because it's not made in the image of God. We are. Now, this doesn't mean that we should worship each other or ourselves. 
Nor does it mean that we are gods ourselves. Worship is only reserved for God. But I do find it interesting that when Jesus sums up all of the Old Testament law, he says that we are to A, love God, and B, love each other. And I think it's partly because when we are loving each other, we are showing to God how much we love and worship him. We are loving and respecting God's representatives, and therefore we are loving and respecting God. And so obviously this has a huge implication around how we treat each other. Because think about it. Every interaction you have with someone is an interaction with someone who is a representative of God, who God has bestowed his image on and has said, this person is made in my image and likeness. And so we're going to delve into this further in the next few weeks. But I want you to think about how messengers and diplomats and envoys were treated when they'd go visit a foreign king. As the king's representative, they were treated like the king themselves. You disrespect the king's representative, then you're disrespecting the king. And this is why I'd argue that how you treat others is deeply indicative of how you view God. And I'd say that Jesus speaks directly to this as well. In Matthew 25, the story of the sheep and the goats, this is what Jesus said. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king, as the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for the, one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So the conversation you had at the start of this message was, was with someone who was being created in the image of God. That interaction you have with the person at school or work is an interaction that you have with someone who has been created in the image of God. The interaction you'll have with the person behind the counter when you buy food tonight is an interaction with someone who has been created in the image of God. Someone who God sees as valuable, even if they don't. And the way that you act, the way that you treat others is showing to the world who you think God is. By being created in the image of God, it means that God intended others to be able to look at our lives and recognize his goodness and his greatness. Remember, we're representatives of God. Because like a picture hanging on the wall, our lives are supposed to point to a greater truth. And that greater truth is about how glorious and how loving God is. And Jesus once again says on the Sermon in the Mount, Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father who is in heaven. That means that everything that we do is either mocking his image or causing others to praise him as creator. And this is why God hates sin. See, sin defaces his image. It cannot destroy his image because you are God's image. And the identity that God gives you is always going to be much greater than the actions that you take. But it defaces his image in us. You see, sin says that I'm not going to image God. I'm not going to be the idol of God. I'm going to image myself. I'm going to make myself God. See, sin is self-focused instead of God and others focused. And that's a bad path to walk down. See, we were born to be perfect representatives of God, perfect images of God, and sin ruins that. And it ruins the life to the full that God wants us to have. Is it any wonder that God hates sin so much that he sent his son to die to remove the power of sin over us? And is it any wonder that one day God will return and he will forever remove from this earth all that is inconsistent with his image? See, you are not the result of nothing plus time plus chance. The person sitting next to you is not the result of nothing plus time plus chance. The person on the bus, the person on the street, the person in a detention center, the person in a prison, all of us are created in the image and likeness of God. And every moment of every day, we are either imaging to the world through our actions that there is a God who is good, that there is a God who loves and wants to have a relationship with people, or we're imaging to the world that there is a God who doesn't care. And your role in life is more than just to be saved and then to behave. It's to reflect who you think God is. People are more important than you think. People are more important than your job. People are more important in your happiness and comfort. So how do you treat people? Not just the people that you like, not just the people who can help you either socially or financially or emotionally, but how do you treat everyone? And so I want to leave you tonight with this quote from C.S. Lewis. Lewis. It's from his book, The Weight of Glory. And I'll put it up on the screen. This is what he says. There are no ordinary people. 
You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. So something to think about. And so I hope from tonight you can see that how you treat others, and especially how you treat those you regard as the least of these, is hugely important too. But I also hope that the way in which you might view yourself has changed a little bit too. You are made in the image of God. God made you in his image to be his representative on earth. And how amazing is that? Like, Also, how much responsibility is that? So do you take it seriously? And it's my hope that you'll join us next week as well as Andy dives a bit deeper into the image of God and how it relates to human rights. But to finish up, if you're leaving here tonight thinking, well, I want to be a better image of God, I want to live as God intends, but I keep screwing up, then I can assure you that you are in good company. Only one person in the history of all of mankind has been the perfect image of God, and they killed him for it. So clearly, even being perfect doesn't mean that life is easy. But can I encourage you? God sent Jesus into the world because we are broken images. You don't need to pretend that you are perfect because the cross of Jesus Christ proves that you're not. See, the book of Colossians says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is, God how, Jesus is how God intended us to be. And by fixing your eyes on him, you can show to the world the type of God that we worship. So live your life in such a way that everything you do points to Jesus. Trust him with your life and let the Holy Spirit work in you for the glory and honor of his name. You are made in the image of God. God made you in his image. So fix your eyes on Jesus and like he said, love God and love each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us the the honor and the privilege of being created in your image and we just pray that we would image you well lord we know that it can be tough we know that there are so many other things that tug against our hearts but lord we know that what you want for us is best i just pray for those that we see out in society those who feel abused and neglected that we would show them that through you, you have given them worth. That their identity isn't found in their actions, but they're found in what you call them, and you call them the image of God. I thank you that you love us, and that you love us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. We just pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we go out um, from this place tonight, that you would be working in our hearts, that we would burn with a passion for your name to be known. And that all people would come to know who you are and the the love that you show. So Lord, let us be strong images of you. Let us perfectly represent you as much as we can through the power of your spirit and by fixing our eyes on Jesus. Lord, be our vision. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.